so we can have a head start. I would like to introduce you to Dr. Dibyesh Anand, originally from India, now associate professor at London's Westminster University. He's an expert on majority-minority relations in China and India. After doing a um, bachelor in history in Delhi, he moved to UK to do master that was followed by PhD on the cultural and political significance of Western representations in Tibet. And what is important for him is uh, his mission, which is to deliver research meaningful to groups that are marginalized, occupied, or suppressed. So this will include topics like Islamophobia in India or relations of Tibetans under Chinese rule. Uh, concerning those topics, he not only published a number of monographs, but he is also, he has a very significant presence in popular media, which include YouTube videos and comment articles in The Guardian. And what you can already see, uh, his talk will uh, be about majority minority, uh, focusing on the examples from China and Tibet and India and Kashmir. So we are really looking forward. Thank you very much. Let me make sure you can hear me at the back. Again, thanks a lot for the organizers for having me here. I'm aware that many of you would see yourself as scientists, and I'm not a scientist. One could say I'm a social scientist, but I don't see myself as a social scientist also, because I don't particularly like the idea of science. The reason I don't like particularly the idea of science is because science is often associated with order, and have an inherent tendency to queer that order, to challenge that order. And I'll end, I'll start with the topic, colonial desires of post-colonial nation states, China in Tibet and India in Kashmir. But I'll also end up with some sort of auto-ethnography of myself, why I'm doing this research. Hopefully by the end of it, you'll get a sense of why I'm using my identity partly to connect with a topic that has very little to do with my identity. Now, it, I have a habit of speaking quite fast, but I'll try to keep it slow also because I understand people who have different grasp of different ideas. But if there's any question you have, please feel free to ask me after my lecture and also after the session. Now, when we look at the terms colonial, desires, okay, I'm not going to deconstruct off here, but colonial, desires, post-colonial, and nation states. Now, when I was introduced, one thing that was mentioned is I'm from India. Right? And one identity many of us have, if I ask you, who are you? Who am I? We think of a gender identity. We think of national identity. And national identity is often seen as very important. So I could be German. I could be Indian. I could be Chinese. I could be British. Of course, British is even more complicated. Are you English or British or Scot or British? But these are identities we have. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of ask ourselves a question to what extent these identities are arbitrary, socially contingent, and yet we consider them to be almost naturalized. So what are the processes through which these identities get naturalized, fixed, to an extent that we stop questioning ourselves? Why are we using those identities? Now, of course, my lecture today is largely about, I said, that uh, India and Kashmir and uh, Tibet in China. I could be talking about Israel in Palestine. I could be talking of Turkey with Kurdistan. I could be talking about Pakistan in Balochistan. Because broadly, my interest is not only Tibet or Kashmir. My interest is largely, as you pointed out, connected to what I see as the nation states and the people they occupy. Right? But I'm going to focus on them. Now, we'll start with, I'm assuming that some of you would know a lot about some of these topics, and many of you would not. So I'm assuming that level of disconnect amongst people in terms of what is the level of knowledge. Now, in India, claims Kashmir to be its own. So India uses the language, Kashmir is an integral part of India. As you would know, it would imply that without Kashmir, India cannot exist. That's why it's integral, essential part of India. So, and Indian Prime Minister today, Narendra Modi, he will talk about how every Indian loves Kashmir. And he talks of how every Indian loves Kashmir at a time when around 87 Kashmiris have been killed, unarmed civilians. You are not even talked of armed militants, but unarmed civilians. More than 120 have been blinded by pellets. Between 8 
8,000 to 32,000 have been injured. Now, it's a big number, right? 8 to 32. The reason we use that is because most Kashmiris who get injured in protest will not go to the hospital. Because if they go to the hospital, then the police come and register them and take the record, and then they will penalize them later. To avoid police case, they avoid hospitals. So that's a wide gap. Right? So this is... Or even more left, even to an extent, anarchists and communists. I'm using different categories, by the way. But one problem one finds with communism is, if you note, especially communism as it developed by early 20th century, was the idea of false consciousness. So workers don't know what's good for themselves. So there's a vanguard party, the communist party, that will develop a particular working class consciousness amongst the workers and help them liberate themselves. Right. So the idea always of not communist liberating themselves, but communist party liberating the workers from the bad bourgeoisie. Now, this is the language which China uses, by the way. So the China uses not the language of nationalism in the beginning. They use the language of communism and mix the two. Problem you could find with that, or the problem I have with that language of liberation is, it's akin to the language of imperialism. When, for instance, the British went to India, or when Napoleon went to Egypt, he talked of liberating Egyptians, in, this, in Egypt and Napoleon context, liberating Egyptians from the Ottomans. So there's always the idea, we are going to liberate you from your oppressive rulers. Maybe it reminds you also of George W. Bush in Iraq war. So in, to an extent, therefore, we can see that communism also, or communist movement also has a particular ethos that can be quite imperialist and co colonialist. Knowing that I know what's good for you, you don't know what's good for you, therefore I will liberate you. And that's what we find in case of China and Tibet. Most of the images, top propaganda images in China would be of, of course, Tibetans being grateful for being liberated. Now, of course, in one context, many, I don't know about you particularly, but I get this question also. By the way, my students are from studying politics, but even they are not very political, many of them. They have very little interest in politics, or at least they think they have no interest in politics. As if being disinterested, which implies bolstering and legitimizing status quo. Let's not mince words. Not being interested essentially, essentially legitimizes the status quo. That is politics. And of course, I have this image, I mean, it's from you, uh, Google, that I'm hungry, stop talking politics. So politics is often seen as something which subverts the authority, as if asserting the authority is not political. But I thought in that context, I'd just tell you that even if you think we are not political, we are political. That's a wider ethos. Now, again, beyond India, China, Tibet, Kashmir, I'm interested in broadly the themes of politics and ethics of boundaries. How do we draw the boundaries? Boundaries of science and social science and humanities. Boundaries of, let's say, politics and economics and biology and physics. And we know a lot of us draw those disciplinary boundaries all the time. Many of us would be aware that those disciplinary boundaries are also arbitrary, which get naturalized over time. So the idea is when the boundary is drawn, you can't, cr can't cross the boundary. Now, in, not in your context, but in our context, specifically in the UK point, there is exercise, research assessment exercise every five to six years. So it's called REF, Research Excellence Framework. In that, they would say, we pre so we sort of recognize and welcome interdisciplinary research. Now I'm head of department, I'm, I'm managing a department, I can assure you almost that in most cases, that's only rhetoric. In most cases, units privilege disciplinary research rather than interdisciplinarity. Because interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity or even anti-disciplinarity is something that 
makes a lot of us in academia anxious. So there's a boundary making. Right? Of course, boundary of nation state, boundary of sexuality. Are you straight? Are you gay? Are you bisexual? Are you queer? Are you transgender? Are you trans? Whatever. So those things are also boundaries that we draw. Again, some of you who may or may not, you should read Foucault again, look at the ways in which these boundaries, including personal identities such as sexualities, get constructed and get reaffirmed. So it's about politics and ethics of boundaries. I hope we challenge it. That's my idea. We also have to challenge the whole idea of normalization of dominance. We sometimes accept dominance as status quo and status quo as the only way in which we can live. Take the examples of passports, take the examples of boundaries, take the example of Germany versus France versus Britain versus something else. So those are naturalization and normalization of dominance. We should also be aware of the ways in which language plays a very crucial role in asserting control and sometimes challenging it. We should also look at categories of identity, interest, ideology. I assume a lot of these could be alien for those of you who are doing what's seen as pure science, but these are important. One important part which I would like to query, of course, is the whole sacrality of nation state. Sacred or sacrality is something we associate with the religious. But when people are willing to die, when people are willing to give their own life, and when people are willing to take your life in the name of nation state, that is sacrality of nation state. My country, right or wrong? And we know what the perils are. I mean, if all the places, Germany is the best example of how nation state or nation statism, when taken to its extreme, leads to what? We know it. And will lead, leads to fascism. Of course, Nazism is a form of fascism, so it's not unique, but it's part and parcel of it. So I would argue, and many of scholars would have argued, that in that context, fascism or nation statism are not unique phenomena. They're essentially forms of nation statism and a question of who can be colonial. So these are various questions I have raised in my own research. If you ask me, have I written something concrete and a big book about colonial desires of post-colonial states? Not really. This is a work in progress, and this will remain a work in progress for long, but hopefully this would be an important contribution made by me in the context that I do think that recognizing, let's say, Kashmiris or Baloch or Tibetan or Palestinian and others as colonized would also have an ethical political dimension, which is right to self-determination for colonial, colonized people. Right? Now, again, another conceptual uh, thing I would like to highlight is, you have to think how categories of thinking are socially contingent, the historically located. I'm giving an example of uh, Africa in this context. Now, if you look at the image of Africa, oh, I mean, I'm using this, what would you call, if you have to use one term for Africa, what's the term you will use? So how do I categorize Africa through this image? Dark continent? Now, right, remember the whole epithet of Africa as a dark continent in the 19th century. Now, dark continent had very little to do with the skin color of people. Because if you looked at the skin color, it would be a range of skin colors in what was seen as Africa. Dark continent was associated with the whole idea of barbarism, backward, not having civilization, and hence, Waiting, for, waiting to be civilized by the Europeans. So Europeans are the ones who bring light to that dark continent. Right? Now again, these images, even today, I mean, not, it, it's changing now. We are more clever at hiding our own racist, racism and racial thinking, but it remains to what, some extent. We may not use the word dark continent anymore, but we may still talk about saving Africa. Right? You have got uh, Bono, U2, and we have got a lot of well-intentioned liberal singers singing songs in the past and trying to help Africa, save Africa. Now think of why would someone want to save Africa? Save Africa from whom? Is it to save Africa from multinational corporations? Is it to save Africa from Europe, from US, from India, from China, from Malaysia, all these countries that are exploiting resources? Or is it to save Africa from African leaders themselves? You'll notice that a lot of it is about saving Africa from Africans themselves. So the reason I mention all of this is because we have to keep in mind that representations are always already political. And we have to therefore always question the kind and forms of representation that we use when we try to understand various identities and various people. Who can be colonial? I mean, if you say to, let's say, an Indian nationalist or a Chinese nationalist, but you are colonizing Kashmir or Tibet, normally the reaction would be, but we are not colonial. We cannot be colonial. Why? because they are victims of colonization. 
China was a victim of colonization of various European countries and Japan. India was a victim of colonization primarily of British. So the idea is how could we, as victims of colonization, be a colonizer? It's like saying, how could we, who is a victim of, let's say, abuse, ever abuse someone else? How could we, who have been victims of Holocaust, ever try to impose a rule on Palestinians in case of Israel, which is akin to apartheid or akin to some form of genocide or some kind of genocide violence, right? So these are the kind of questions we have to keep in mind. So a lot of time, nationalists in India or China would deny the identity as being co colonizer. Now, again, keep aside China in, in India. Take example, what is colonialism? What is colonization? According to Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, I use that a lot, it says essentially it refers to the project of European political domination. Why European political domination? There's no answer. So my question then is, is it only Europeans or is it only white European who have the capacity to colonize? Because that is the subtext. In one context, the liberal left in Europe would say, look, we are being very self-reflexive. We recognize that we colonize people and that was not good. But it also had the idea that only we have the capacity to be the colonizers. How can Indians and the Chinese and the Turks and others be ever colonizers? So they, it is some sort of a reverse, but still, I would argue, a white privilege to see oneself as only capable of colonizing. European political domination. Because there's no intellectual rationality, there's no political rational to recognize colonization as only European. And that is a problem with how often the left and even the right thinks about colonization, colonialism and imperialism today. So empire and colonialism is seen as something of the past. It's over. But what is colonization and colonialism broadly? Colonization, of course, is a process. It's about asymmetric relation of power. Right? So for instance, if you colonize them, you colonize them you'd never have an equal relation, right? So it's always unequal. So you dictate terms to them. Now, colonization includes violence, but colonization also includes paternalism. I'm ruling you for your welfare because you're not capable of ruling yourself. That's the basic ethos. So colonization is about essentially asymmetric relation of power that can never be subverted. It is about alien territorial control. You control a territory that's seen as outside. It's about controlling people who are different, who are seen as different. It is also about knowledge production. Those of you who may have come across the whole idea of Orientalism, Edward Said, Franz Fanon, if not, you should read. For simple reason, because they argue that empire and imperialism was never only about brutal political rule, it was also about knowledge production. How do you produce knowledge about the other? Right? It's about knowledge production, it's about economic exploitation, it is about cultural subservience of the other. It is about racialization, ethnicization. It's about social transformation, militarization, violence. Right? So think of what have you studied when you were a child about colonization, colonialism. You get a sense of what colonization is. Right? So one people ruling the other people in the name of progress, in the name of civilization. Remember, white man's burden. Right? Those kind of things. Now... When we take example again, Indian nationalism or Chinese nationalism, what we find is a strong sense of victimization. We were victims. And victimization is also connected to a certain form of fetishization of anti-colonial nationalism. Because we were victims, so you should never criticize us. And because we're victims, we can never victimize someone else. And because we were victims, you should never question our project of sovereign nation state. So, what this history of victimization or the narrative of victimization leads to is a sense that don't question us ever because if you question us then somehow we are going to dismember so these are states such as you know india and china and many others in post colonial world that would argue that we have strong nationalism but they are very paranoid also about any kind of questioning of it right now Again, I'll not go into detail here, though I've been, normally I would have if to introduce you the subject, but broadly India argues, and this is, we are talking of territorial problem, we are talking of uh, people's problem, the dominant register through which Kashmir conflict is understood is Kashmir is a conflict between India and Pakistan over who should rule Kashmir. So it's between India and Pakistan. What that dominant register, what that dominant language does is, it ignores Kashmiris as people who may have right to self-determination.
right? It's between India and Pakistan. So two nation states fighting over a territory. China, or sorry, in the case of Tibet, again, Tibet is often seen as an issue of human rights, but not right to self-determination. Why? Because even the West, that may have sympathy with the Dalai Lama, have you all heard of Dalai Lama? Right. Right. Sympathy with Dalai Lama would be reluctant to antagonize China. And therefore they say we recognize Chinese sovereignty, but China should give some human rights. So almost begging China to give human rights to uh, Tibetans. So those are kind of discourses. Again, you can read if you are interested about these things, but my interest is less to talk about what is the dominant way of looking at it, but also providing an alternative of way of looking at it. I said the alternative way is to understand the experience of Kashmiris and experience of Tibetans as one of colonization. The crucial question then is, who decides who's Indian, who's Chinese? Is it Kashmiris who will decide they're Indian, or is it Indians who will decide Kashmiris are Indian? In the discourse that exists in India or in uh, China, Tibetans or Kashmiris have no right to decide for themselves that they want to be part of India or China. It's already given to them. And you can see that asymmetric relation of power here. Of course, many Kashmiris, many Indians, uh, sorry, many Tibetans would see themselves as occupied. So occupation is opposite of the idea that our understanding one's own experience as occupation is opposite of how the state would understand, which is you are an integral part of us. Right? Now, basic element is asymmetry of power. So for instance, in 1990s, China was more blunt or honest or it's a crude in how it brought about this white paper. White paper is a document that the government brings about to present its own policy. China would call Tibet its ownership and human rights situation. Its ownership. So yes, China owns Tibet. Again, I can see you, you could guess what the language of ownership does. So it is like a thing that Tibet owns, sorry, China owns. So that's language of ownership. You'll find in India, of course, Jam Jammu and Kashmir are integral part of India. I'd say Jammu and Kashmir is and shall be an integral part of the Union of India. Is is the present, and shall be means forever. So there is no option for Kashmir or Tibetans to ever assert themselves as separate. So this is the asymmetry of power I'm talking about. So not only direct territorial control through military, but also political control. In case of, again, China, what you find, of course, the Chinese flag have to be always there, and Tibetans have to be forever grateful to China for having liberated them and controlling them. In case of India, again, even there is a cartographic fiction. This is a map, and it says, basically, no publisher can re represent reality. The reality is, the state of Jammu and Kashmir de facto, part of it is controlled by Pakistan, part of it is controlled by India, and part of it is controlled by China. So right, that's how it de facto the map is. Now, if you show that de facto map in India, it's an illegal map, and you cannot show it. So you'd be imprisoned and fined. All the books or the magazines, including The Economist, they get censored if they show the reality of the map. So what Indian nationalism does is, and Indian state does it, it makes illegal the representation of reality. And you have to therefore maintain the fiction. The fiction that the entire Jammu and Kashmir, which is here, is integral part of India. Regardless of where you come, you have to represent this. Of course, Google is a clever um, way they, they manage it. The kind of map of Kashmir you get in Google search here in Germany or UK will show you the de facto part. When you search for that in India, you'd often see what India wants. And when you search for it in Pakistan, you'll see what Pakistan wants. Right? So that's how Google and other companies manage. But it's what I want to emphasize therefore to you is that how the ways in which territorial control also goes in along with how the map and cartographic control takes place. In case of again, Tibet autonomous region, that's uh, the autonomous, autonomous in the Chinese context essentially means less, fewer rights, by the way, not more rights. And I'll explain that to you later. But what you have here is, for instance, you have got Chairman Mao, Deng Xiaoping, and uh, Jiang Zemin, later Hu Jintao, and now I'm sure, sure Xi Jinping, so all these Communist Party leaders, whose pictures you'd often find in the prayer room of model Tibetan houses in model Tibetan villages. These are model because we were taken on a delegation. I was part of that team to look at how India, cre sorry, not how China has created model villages. Right? But again, the so Communist Party leaders are worshipped like the sacred in the altars. You can see that's political control. In case of India, 
China, you could excuse it as a communist country, authoritarian country, and therefore what else can you expect? India is the world's largest democracy. You may have heard of it from time to time. India uses essentially democracy to control Kashmir. So democracy is something that is used by people against the government to gain more rights. So for instance, if your right to speech is being curbed, you say, but we live in a democracy. How could you curb our rights? In case of Kashmir, India uses democracy to prevent any criticism of human rights. So if you criticize India's conduct in Kashmir, they say, but we are world's largest democracy. Why are you killing so many people? Why are you raping? Why are armed forces raping so many people? Oh, but we are world's largest democracy. So democracy is a tool through which colonization gets justified. There's a control over bodies, corporeal control. Colonization can never be only through ideas. It's also about war bodies. Of course, there are between 80,000 to 100,000 Kashmiris who have been killed from since 1990s. It's not only killing that's there, but enforced disappearance between 8 to 10,000 Kashmiris have been forcibly disappeared. And these are people for whom there's record. Into government says there's record, but armed forces cannot be prosecuted. And I'll explain to you why armed forces cannot be prosecuted. Right? So enforced disappearance. This is an image. I made this kid. His, uh, remember, when you are forcibly disappeared, imagine you. If you are disappeared, then it's not only you who's, who's a victim, but your entire family gets victimized. Because let's say if you are a, a married, then the woman keeps waiting. It's a phenomenon of half widows because women don't know whether they're a widow or not. You keep waiting. The family, the parents, they suffer. So it's a collective form of brutalization, collective form of um, victimization. Now, India not only controls the living bodies, or tries to control the living bodies, but it also controls the dead bodies. So there are two cases, 1984 and 2013, where two different Kashmiris were hanged, and the bodies never returned to the family. So you see, in a sense, you do, so the state not only colonizes your body when you're living, but also sometimes try to colonize you when you're dead. In case of Tibet, again, colonization of a body is clear, imprisonment, there's hardly any record of how many people get imprisoned. Of course, people protest sometimes through self-immolation. But in case of China, it's also control over manifestation. You know what manifestations are? Reincarnation. I assume many of you don't know what reincarnation is. Dalai Lama is a reincarnate Lama. So there are several reincarnate Lama that I can explain to you later if you want. But essentially what the Chinese Communist government says is that no reincarnation can take place without central government's permission. So we have a situation where Communist Party claims to be the authority over how after one, many, one body is gone, the second body comes up, right? So what happens, let's say the Dalai Lama as a body dies, but the same Dalai Lama manifestation comes out in the form of another small baby or small boy, usually boy, sometimes women also, later. So manifestation is essentially the state between one body and the other body, right? And of course, if you're atheist, you would see what is this about, but you have to understand more than six million Tibetans believe in it. But what the Communist Party says is that they are the final authority. So there can be no reincarnation, there can be no reincarnation of Lamas without the permission of central government. Again, you could see the paradox of it, but it exists. It's a control of manifestations. Colonization is about producing knowledge. So it's not about ruling people, but it's about producing knowledge. So in case of China and Tibet, again, the whole idea, Tibet has always belonged to China. So there's an insistence through exhibitions, through museums, Tibet has always belonged to China. And yet, the Chinese have liberated Tibet. So then you ask, if Tibet always belonged to China, who did the Chinese liberate them from? Themselves? And that's a contradiction, because... If you say, oh, but you know, his, uh, one of the rhetoric used by the Chinese government is, but we have developed China. Look at old Tibet, before 1951. It was a horrible place, a feudal place, and we have liberated Tibet. Now, if Tibet was always part of China, then everything wrong in old Tibet should be responsibility of China, but somehow it's not responsibility of China, but of Tibetan Buddhism. So that's a contradiction. Reality is, China cannot remove that contradiction, because that contradiction is at the heart of the colonial project. So you want to claim, but you also want to represent yourself as a liberator. Producing your knowledge, rewriting history, and there's an entire project of rewriting history. In case of India, you have got a racialized production of knowledge about uh, Kashmiris, of what Kashmiris are somehow innocent, beautiful people, fooled by Pakistan, or they're innocent, not innocent, they're wily people because they're Muslims, 
So that also comes up here. Those kind of production of knowledge is there. Indian media, which you'd think would be free, of course, is largely a propaganda tool for the state. Sometimes Indian media is more nationalist than the government itself. Right? So for instance, they always present military as the liberator, as the defender, as the protector of Kashmiri people. Again, I can explain that later. Development, of course, development is taking place in Tibet or in Kashmir. But we have to keep in mind that development has never been opposite of colonization. Colonization has often used development for its own gains. So development is essentially a mechanism of control in case of Tibet or, or Kashmir. So you build railways, you, build, uh, you create jobs, but you create jobs to make people dependent. So as I said, I'm giving an overview. So what we find in case of Kashmir and Tibet is essentially a modernizing state. But I would argue it's not a modernizing state where Kashmiris and Tibetans have equal say or primary say. It's a modernizing state where it's a form of colonial modernity where essentially its terms are dictated by Beijing or by Delhi, the capital by of China. It's through cultural control. Again, I'll not go into details here, but cultural controls in terms of controlling language, controlling faith, controlling religion, controlling other aspects. All this empire over Kashmir or Tibet is managed through, of course, web of real and virtual control. Surveillance, beating, control over uh, social media, control over media. Right? So all these forms are there. Demographic transformation, making the population minority. Now, in case of Tib uh, Xinjiang, Xinjiang is another part of China where Uyghur Muslims were the majority. Now, from 90% in 1950s, the population of Uyghur, Uyghur Muslims is around 48 to 49 officially. It's through largely large scale migration. Now, violence in the end. So you could have knowledge production, you could have uh, development, you could have paternalism. Paternalism is a very important form. And one normal rhetoric used by Indian and Chinese nationalists, but you see, Tibetans and Kashmiris are not fit to govern themselves, and therefore we have to govern them for their own good, is in the end violence. Violence which is epistemic, systemic, everyday, normalized, exceptional. All forms of violence take place. We will not go into detail here, but violence is at the heart of it. In case of India, again, I said, you could see, Violence is part and parcel of rule of law. There's a particular law in India which allows the government exceptional power in times of emergency. Armed Forces Special Powers Act. In Kashmir, since 1990, this act has been there. And it has not been withdrawn. So an exceptional emergency law for 26 years. In case of northeastern part of India, another contested territory, it's there for 50 years now. What essentially does it? It allows armed forces impunity. So for instance, if you are a soldier and you are accused of committing sexual violence or torture or rape. Now, police also or people are going to bring case against you, take you to the court, but they need permission from your military unit to take you to the court, but they won't get permission because they need permission in the end. Even courts say that you should be prosecuted. You need permission from Ministry of Defense or Ministry of Home Affairs back in Delhi. Until today, zero permissions have been granted. So India would say, but we have got democratic control. But in reality, there is no democratic control. The cases of mass rape, Kunan Pushwa is one of the examples. These are pellets, and pellets are seen as non-lethal way of policing. Non-lethal way of policing that blinds people, that injures certain people and kills few people, but it's not still bullets. So these are the forms of law that are justified within rule of law in India. So blinding takes place, and pellet injury is one of them, of course, apart from bullets. But when you challenge India or China, the idea is always, what about? And I say, what about? But what about minorities? So if Kashmir becomes free, what would happen to religious minority? What if we liberate Tibet? No one is not liberate, sorry. What if we allow Tibet more rights? What about other parts of China? So this what about questions are often used to legitimize further colonization. All the questions are relevant. What about minorities? So what would happen to queer people in Jammu and Kashmir? Imagine if Jammu Kashmir becomes free and majority people are Muslims. As if Muslims are somehow more Islamophobic than the Hindu Republic that India is, though it's officially secular. Right? So these are questions. But what about, I would say, an unethical point, unless you raise what about question to talk of rights of the all. And I'll conclude in the next uh, few minutes. What we find is there's a masking of colonization through promotion of nationalism. Keep in mind that Kashmiris or Tibetans are small population compared to the population of India or China. So the primary way in which colonization can continue is by keeping its own public either unaware of the situation, 
or complicit with the nation state colonial nation states colonial project so what we find of course is follow me nationalism kind of thing it exists so if you criticize india and kashmir then go to pakistan right that's a normal rhetoric if you if you're han chinese who criticizes the chinese government then you're seen as somehow anti china so those are normal rhetoric and my wider conceptual point is that nationalism of certain form taken to its own extreme and you could recognize here of course in both cases narendra modi and hitler and you got xi jinping called xi hitler also sometimes but xi jinping and hitler the reason i mention that is because nation state anywhere by the way not only india and china taken to its extreme and complicit with the state can and does lead to forms of fascism so what india is witnessing today what china is witnessing in some form nationalism a strands of fascism strands of fascism because in the name of nation statism you have denial of minority rights in practice in name of nationalism and nation statism you have got suppression of any dissenting voice so that's what's taking place and you have use of violence by the by the nationalists so i would argue that at the heart of nationalism lies the politics of othering politics of othering where you see minorities as the other the other who should be domesticated or exterminated and we know what the extreme version of that was right in case of germany you see similar forms existing in india and china today more so in india because fascism in that context emerged more easily in societies that were seen as democratic because sometimes you need more violence in democracy to prove your point in authoritarian you don't need that level of violence you have other forms of violence that exist right so what i argue therefore that post colonial is connected with colonial so they're connected so if until unless we challenge the nation state project forever and perpetually nation statism taken to its extreme does lead to forms of fascism which is forms of intolerance forms of bigotry forms of killing forms of dehumanization and this is a, i always use facebook because i use facebook a lot some of you would know remember even when you go to auschwitz if you been there you would find that it is about work sets you free right work sets you free what's wrong with that work sets you free you know the connotation of work sets you free so the fact that a state is using a mild language does not necessarily imply it's mild so in case of india they'll talk about humanity democracy while ruling kashmir so the fact that india uses democracy or humanity does not necessarily imply that we take it for granted as what is promoting is humanity and democracy because when we look at it in practice we find it's promoting anti democracy and anti humanity that's why i deliberately use this image that language has to be questioned or raised you got examples and it's not only really that state is complicit but a large number of public growing number of public is complicit let's take this example this is from facebook that uh, this i had posted someone and remove the name of course says keep democracy humanity aside for a couple of days and clean kashmir up once and for all the language is essentially one of genocide in fact you would find that indian military paramilitary with all their violence are still milder than some indian hindu nationalists who are calling for large scale genocide bombing of people sending tanks in without knowing anything about it so the reason i mention this is because this is part and parcel of what would say popularization of pop prejudice against kashmiris now in case of han chinese also you have got something similar that's taking place but what often is violence at the periphery of the nation state let's say kashmir is the periphery of indian nation state or tibet is periphery of uh, chinese nation state violence also comes back at the heart of it so the suppression of people there also leads to suppression of people here so you have what is of course lawyers in Ch- lawyers in china human rights lawyers in china being forcibly disappeared by the state and no one can do anything about it what you have got is indians a few indians who support the right to self determination or talk about human rights of kashmir would be accused of being traitors and suppressed that's a part and parcel going on there that doesn't mean that there's always violence there's always resistance and i'll talk of resistance during question answer if you want but you have got resistance both uh, in kashmir and of course also in tibet and other p- places so what i would conclude with the idea that what we need if we want to have an ethical standpoint is i would argue decolonized decolonization decolonization would be promotion and supporting azadi which is freedom freedom would imply right to live with dignity and other things but essentially my argument would be we cannot be neutral in similar situations when you have got an asymmetry of power and this level of asymmetry of power the only ethical view point for me would be to support the colonized rather than the colonizer and therefore we should care 
let's say here in Germany or elsewhere, because it's not something taking place elsewhere. It's taking place in the name of humanities. I would say that if we support stateless people and occupied people, we should support and care about what's happening to Kashmiris and Tibetans. If we care about minority rights, we should care about what's taking place. If we care about democracy and the ideas of liberation, we should pay attention to what's taking place in Kashmir and Tibet. If we care about human rights, the right to self-determination, right to live with dignity and freedom, or if we care about human beings, and that all human beings are equal who should have right to live with dignity, then we should care about what's taking place in those parts of the world. And I'd end with this argument that the reason I talk of it is because part of it is an autoethnography for me. Autoethnography because in one sense we can never be, and this is something I'll raise in the evening session today, we can never be distant from our own research. So for instance, for me, questioning these things are connected to my own identity, not an identity as a suppressed. I don't see myself as suppressed. Though in terms of my own queer identity, I could be seen as marginalized, but I see my identity as something that's complicit or connected with the privileges of being not decolonized in case of India and other places. So for me, it's very important that we challenge, we queer the nation. You don't need to be sexually queer in order to be a queer, political queer, but queer the nation state because in the name of nation state comes fascism. I'm assuming all of you are, by, by the way, anti-fascist. That's my common assumption. Mm, I hope so. <laughs> but queer the nation state, and in that process, queer, na query nation statism. So I hope you join me in thinking about the forms of violence and dehumanization that are taking place against people in different parts of the world, including in Kashmir and Tibet, and support the right to self-determination and right for human rights, sorry, and, and human rights in those places. Thank you very much. Thank you again for your talk. Uh, we still have time for a couple of questions before we go for lunch. Um, thanks for the great talk. I have uh, some problem with your assessment of uh, Kashmir, in case of Kashmir, uh, India occupying it. First of all, it was a legal accession of Kashmir by the king of that time to India. And when the Britishers left, they gave all the princely states of the time a choice to make whether they want to stay independent or they want to be part of India or Pakistan. And at that time, under the circumstances, the king of Kashmir chose to be part of, become uh, part of India. Second, uh, that, uh, that Kashmiris don't uh, have a right, enough rights to rule themselves. So in last general election in 2014, the Lok Sabha election, and also their assembly election, there was like around 70% turnover rates of the voters who came, which were to, to vote for. And that clearly shows that there is enough democracy, and those people have enough rights to actually de decide their leaders. Third, that uh, about the use of army by India in the Kashmir region. And there you have to con also consider the Pakistan factor. Because Pakistan um, has reportedly many times uh, tried to induce armed uh, resurgency in Kashmir. And this is something that India has to deal with. And no country nowhere in the world wants to, uh, wants to have an unstable region as part of its uh, territory. So okay. that's all. Thank you. Thank you. There are very important points in terms of the uh, argument is that, one, uh, the accession of state of Jammu and Kashmir was legal. Second is about what about democratic elections or elections in Kashmir? Because a lot of time, not always, but a lot of time Kashmir have voted in large numbers. So doesn't it show that democracy exists? And third is about the army is not there only to suppress people, but more importantly because of Pakistan, which is, has an inimical relation with India. The way I'll respond to that is, again, keep in mind, there's a legality part, accession. There's a whole debate over whether the accession to India was legal or not, whether it was coerced or not, and the background to that was that there was a princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, which was Muslim majority, but ruled by Hindu ruler. And this is important to keep in mind because many would argue that there was another state, Hyderabad, Nizam, where the ruler was Muslim, but the majority were Hindus. And Indian state argued that because people were majority Hindu, and therefore the state should be part of India. Right? So India used different standards when it tried to get princely states as part of it. The so Jammu Kashmir becomes more crucial because it could have gone to Pakistan, Muslim majority, 
or it could have gone to India if people had chosen. Now the thing is for me, legalities are important, but more than that, even if the ruler had chosen India, in which case he was a minority who, would have, who had chosen India, they were given no option of Azadi, which is independence from both. Both India and Pakistan are complicit in denying an independence position to Jammu and Kashmir. And second, for me, the colonial experience is not about rulers deciding what's good for the ruler, ruled. It is about people having a right. If, for instance, Kashmir, if, you, if people think that majority of Kashmir, including other parts of Jammu and Kashmir, would, be support, would support India and only few Muslims in some parts want Pakistan or independence, India should have the confidence, given India the major power, confidence to hold a plebiscite and see what people want. So that's what my argument would be, that if India is confident about its legality and about its own position in Kashmir, it could easily allow for a plebiscite and then let people decide. If majority decide India, why not? In terms of elections, very briefly, interesting phenomenon again. When political parties fight election in Kashmir, none of them say that there's no political problem. They always say there's a political dispute that will be resolved between India, Pakistan and us later. But we are fighting election for issues of governance today. But the elections, the same elections are presented in Indian media and by Indian state as somehow validating the Indian rule in Kashmir. So that's part of the problem with the elections. And third, army because of Pakistan. Now, it's very in disturbing or interesting phenomenon that said the world's most militarized zone, which is Kashmir, 700,000 military, paramilitary and police, by the way, 700,000. World's most militarized zone is in world's largest democracy. Now, part of it you could say is with, with Pakistan because Pakistan can stir up trouble. But Pakistan can it really stir up trouble unless there's also genuine grievance amongst people is a question. So for instance, a lot of these disappearances, killings you could still say maybe they were militant, some of them, but a lot of disappearances and the cases of well-documented cases of rape, mass rape, including in Kun Pushpura, were done by Indian armed forces, not the Pakistanis. So what I would argue is, Take example, two years ago when there were the elections in Kashmir, Indian government says Pakistan is now unimportant because people have voted, right? And yet, when there's a large-scale uprising and protest in Kashmir today, India says it's all fault of Pakistan. So either Pakistan is not powerful and has no influence, or Pakistan has all the influence. So the Indian nationalism cannot have it both way, is what I would argue. Thanks. And I'll give brief answer next time, sorry. <laughs> Forgive me for asking a very provocative question. You talked about decolonization. Do you think Brexit is equivalent to decolonization? Now there, you know, this is something, I mean, I think that's the biggest tragedy that's happened in Britain for decades. So let me just be clear on that. You know, we had a vote, people were allowed to vote, and it fell 51-49. I guarantee if we had the vote a week later, it would have been different. So you've given people the right, and now we have to face the consequences, even though many people don't want it to happen, or most people don't want it to happen. Thank so you I, again. For yeah. me, the big message about your talk is communication is key. It is. Come and in terms of Brexit and race, oh, I said Brexit and racism, because I always associate Brexit with racism, by the way, right? Now imagine if Brexit vote had led to the other way around, 49-51. So people like, I guess you, us, who support being part of European Union, say I support being part of European Union, not because European Union is somehow great, but at least European Union is the only project that went against nation statism to an extent, right? We would have liked the vote then. So the question then is, can we trust the people with a right to vote or right to decide. It can always be problematic. But I would not see the Brexit as part of decolonization, though of course UKIP and all those right-wing parties would present it in the similar manner because what we find in case of European Union and Britain was Britain had maintained in various ways its sovereignty. Only sovereignty had given up was the one it chose deliberately. So in one context, it's a different phenomenon. So European Union could not send the military and could not use violence against the British people. And I said violence is the heart of colonial projects. So it's a different thing. But second question of trusting people with making a decision for themselves. Like it or not, we have no option but we to, to do that because there's no other alternative. Because sometimes we may not like the vote, but other times we even want similar kinds of vote. So this is the challenge we face, that how to communicate, how to make clear that... So it's about debate, but I would still 
believe in referendums and plebiscite than letting the elite decide whether they should be part of your opinion or not. And of course, with Brexit, it's not the... I know there's a whole idea that working classes decided to leave and everything. That's partly true, but partly when you look at UKIP, when you look at Boris Johnson, there's nothing working class about them. It's largely elite versus elite. Thank you. Okay, one more question, then we can go for lunch. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, this is a bit relevant to what you exactly just said about either elites deciding or what, how the plebiscite works. Uh, it seems like this conflict with Kashmir is a major issue and, I mean, more or less growing up in the European environment, I wasn't very familiar. And it was, as I got many classmates from India, I had to learn a bit about it. And I wasn't even sure, even reading, like, say, Wikipedia or going following the links, I guess each side could find different reasonable um, uh, opinions on, on, on the conflict. But I would bring up an example of um, Crimea, let's say. So how valid is this plebiscite? I mean, in this situation where the territory is completely dominated by either media and the opinions of one of the sides, how valid can we, can we um, call this sort of votes? Yeah, of course. When we have got, let's say, intervention by a powerful state and separation of then a small entity from another state through plebiscite with 99% of vote or 90% of vote, the biggest problem there is that can we be sure that it reflects the will of the people there? That's one. And secondly, what does it say about the only ways in which people can get freedom today? Only way in which they can get freedom from another state is through foreign intervention, which is a sad reality of how things take place today. But when we take example of Kashmir or Tibet, for instance, you're right, the different reasonable arguments. Now, imagine yourself in 1930s Germany. 1930s Germany, you'd find that a language of Nazis was also very reasonable language. The language of Holocaust was a reasonable language, a language of reason. Of course, some people have already argued that, so I'm sort of repeating it. The idea is certain minorities cannot be trusted. Certain minorities are like pests. Certain minorities are parasites. Certain minorities are dangerous subversives. So what is the best way to deal with them? Identify them, separate them, put them into camps, and exterminate them. Right? So what I'm saying is language of fascism is a language of reason in that context. So the fact that you may find reasonable argument doesn't imply that it is the ethical argument. In case of India and Indians, simple thing, what reason, or so what ethical reason, what ethical politics can allow for, let's say, me as an Indian to say that you as a Kashmiri could be raped, you as a Kashmir could be blinded, you could be killed, all because I believe that you are an integral part of me. It reminds me of certain kinds of abusive personal relation where whether you like it or not, your partner likes it or not, you control the partner. So therefore, I would argue that while they might be reasonable arguments, and the biggest reason for, um, for in favor of India, by the way, would be the fact that India could not and should not have a hostile Jammu and Kashmir against it. So the best solution in my view would be an independent Jammu and Kashmir that is by treaty guaranteed to be neutral between or amongst Pakistan, India and China. Wouldn't that help everyone? That will bring peace between India and Pakistan. That will give right to self-determination to Kashmiris. That would make peace in the region. But who will lose? Of course, arms traders here arms sellers in Russia, US, Europe, everywhere, who would lose the military and the security industries in India and Pakistan and China. But the reality is independent Jammu and Kashmir may be good for majority of Indians, majority of Pakistanis, and even majority of Chinese. Thanks. Last question there, because he had raised his hand. No? OK. okay. All right. Yeah, so that's fine. Dr. Oh. Dibiash will be available during lunch and uh, later coffee breaks. Let's thank him again for his talk and exciting discussion.